jumped over the bench. Let's go. All righty. Welcome back to the RDN Roller Show here. We got another, we got a banger of a pod again, back-to-back pods, um, you know, two tournament owners, two Team USA coaches. This is going to be a great time. Um, but first, send it over to Ant, see how Ant's doing on uh, over on the East Coast. Yeah, so um, we had a great, great pod the other day with Tim McManus going over the senior men roster. Um, he did a really good job at explaining everything. So we're back. We're on like back to back games here, you know, yeah. doing another pod with Darren here. Uh, good one coming up here on the podcast. And uh, it's kind of you know, like we're in playoffs, at, yeah. you know, State Wars and Arch. You know what yeah. I mean? We're in playoffs. We're pucks are in deep and we're grinding. You got that quarterfinal game Saturday night, got a rebound Sunday morning for your semifinal sort of thing. And that's kind of where we are right now. So the voices are a little hoarse, but we'll, uh, you know, we'll be able to, um, you know, power through it here. Other than that, um, like I mentioned last week, just look forward to winter awards. We had like seven teams. They're all technically eight teams from NERC and uh, it's like six or seven of them playing under the advocate uh, and NERC kind of banner. So pretty cool that we have. Uh, it's a lot for me to deal with, but uh, but pretty cool that we have that many teams coming from our rink. Yeah. Sounds like, uh, you know, that East coast, um, you know, when it was always a huge thing. And I know that they have Narch, the Narch Irvine regional coming up in April as well, too. I believe it's the, like the 24th. I want to not the 24th, like the 26th, probably got the dates up wrong, but they're in, I know it is in April. You can ask that. You can ask that. Yeah. But it's one of the biggest, um, regionals, you know, in hockey, um, you know, for, for a regional tournament is that Narch, Irvine qualifier, which is always a sick qualifier. You get, you know, some really yeah. top talent. I remember as a kid, you know, and even now, but as a kid, um, you know, playing with the Kodiaks, that was a tournament that we would just wanted to go to, you know, like if you're playing 14, 16s, any youth, that's, you know, you want to go to that regional because you get to play these like yeah. just other nasty teams. So, um, you know, yeah. that's coming up too. probably talk to Darren about that as well, too. Yeah, we I know they uh, they're sold out about their next two regionals. So Chicago is this weekend coming up and then. Yep. SoCal the following weekend, and they'll be in Philly actually on May. I, I was talking to Darren. It's a little close to the due date, so I don't know if I'll be there, but okay. uh, so we'd love to be there. But um, where it's getting close, man. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, kid's about to be a real roller dad. I'm like legit building cribs, and I was talking to um, and we'll, we'll talk about this later. But I was talking to a couple of the girls from Team USA, just like for social media stuff for Musars, and like they're like, "Oh my God, we're so excited for you!" So it was like pretty cool, you know what I mean? getting uh getting some praise there from them so yeah there you go dude now you're gonna have to get the guy into you know playing some playing well, some soon little dominic man so dommy that's uh, Dom, man. Very good. an italian up. name right yeah italian name, family man. brother uh, that's family brother yeah. yep so brother uh, dom's gonna be a roller guy soon enough so there we go um you know before we send it over to the pod you know we've kind of you know we've touched on a lot of you know different things in the last pod but first you know that Instagram account Wheels Wheels and Reels, yeah, California. You know they yeah. put out of uh, at the rinks in Redding, California. I was talking to the guy that you know runs it. I don't think he wants to be named, so I'm just not going to save it. Save it. Uh, you know we're a players pod, so uh, that rink is actually unbelievable. I've never seen like the full size. You know, just like what it looks like in the morning and stuff. And they posted a video of it the other day on Instagram, and I was like, Dude, that's a beautiful rink. I did not realize Redding, California is like basically in Canada, Canada, it feels like it's, yeah, it's, it's like three cool. hours from San Jose. Yeah, it's 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 a hike. But, I think Chucky Robinson plays out of there, right? Yep so, yep. so he's always on that account. But yeah, I saw that video. I was like, wow, because it reminded me of they like, do him dirty yeah, on that account. He, I, I mean, they just wrote like one of the best yeah. goalies in the world. And he's just they're just throwing up slides of him just getting like, you know, Michigan. So they, they had the one video where he flipped his lid up and the guy was like, kind of, it was like a turnover. He said, he explained it to us. It was a turnover and it came back the other way. He flipped his lid down and gets scored on. And that thing blew up on this, like Facebook, the goalie uh, sluts United page. It like blew up on there. And people were just roasting him for like flipping his helmet up in like middle of a game. And he's like, dude, it's roller. It's a hundred degrees in there. It's a like, beer league game. Like a beer league game on a like Wednesday, like leave me alone. But it was like, it went viral. So, but the rink itself like reminds me of our old sports spec rink. So I always like, like the first thing I noticed when I saw the account, you know, and then he, he, you know, he roasts goalies and then he praises goalies too with like big saves. So he's kind of got both ends of the spectrum, but uh definitely looks like a pretty sweet place. I like both even ends of the play. spectrum. Yeah. <laughs> so, Yes, yeah, I know the rink sick. Just, you know, I thought I'd throw it out there. I know that wheels on reels counts kind of like, you know, blowing up. So shout out to them. But it's a uh, it's just it, it's a cool rink. So it'd be cool to have like a, a regional there. But it is like 
hella far from everything. I didn't realize, like, I know Chico is probably like, you know, a little far further from that where most of those kids are from, but Jesus, I did not realize that's how far they traveled. Like, that's like basically a travel for us to go to California. I feel like so. Yeah, it's like a hike. I mean, California. yeah, so that's now yeah, that is a hike. Um, you know, we got NCRHA nationals too coming up. Um, you know, that's always, I think it's like the D2, D3 division that's always the biggest. D one's very competitive. You know, you got the powerhouse Lindenwood. You know, you got Bethel Grand Canyon. Um, you know, you got a. I don't. You know, you got a. You got a, You got a good group. I think it's eight teams. Um, yeah. Lindenwood always kind of finds their way to have you know more of the stacked powerhouse team. Rightfully so. Does a lot of recruiting. Grand Canyon has started doing that as well, and Bethel too. Um, yeah. you know, and it is it is pretty cool to see. Um, I did see Bethel and Grand Canyon played in like some type of Kelly Cup tournament. I think it like. I don't not Kelly Cup tournament, but like it was like a yeah, a college bowl. I think more of a warm up for them um, to go into in nationals. So that that was pretty cool to see. Yeah, I mean, even uh, so, I had some like kind of funny thing I ran into too. We have uh, Temple University here is actually playing um, Colorado. Uh, so let's go Buffs. I know. You know, where to, you know where to find us. He was he was asking me. He's like, "Are they good? Do you know?" I was like, "I don't know, but I know they got sick unis and their goals got matching pads. So that's always a good start." Yeah, but actually, the CU Buffs team is pretty good. A lot of some of the fire kids. Uh, it depends if one of their players, Adam. I think it's Adam Trump. Depends if he goes. Uh, he plays on their ice team. Nasty player. Uh, they have a squad when their squad shows up. It just depends who goes. They have a player, Jason Rieger. But, disgusting. Uh, he's really good. So it just yeah, you know it, it's, college national. Nas- it's college nationals. It's college nationals. And I think with any type of finals, Narch finals, Pama Pro, players play a different level, you know. And there's one shout out, you know, this is kind of off topic, but like uh, Ruben Rumbot, um, you know, a player on our Demon Dogs team and stuff. That dude, you know, Paiha, regular season, great. When it came to playoffs and you're playing another team that plays nationals like he does, that dude took another level. And I mean, like another level. So it's like some players do play to another level when it comes to nationals, and some don't. So it's, you know, it is always weird to see that transition of playing local guys. Okay, you feel comfortable to playing people you've never played before and seeing how actual comfortable you are. So it really just depends what, you know, who shows up with that team, but they are a good squad. Yeah. And I also like, you know, talking about like the nationals in general, like one thing I do like about like the college nationals they're usually in like cool locations so like where they are in maine it's so sweet up there it's like a totally different vibe it's almost like mountainous vibe you know what i mean like you're going away on a ski trip or something but it's a definitely a cool little spot to have it and the norway savings bank arena is sick too so interested to see how it looks like in that that arena so they yeah. do a good job at uh, selecting where it's going to be this year as well. They uh they've done one in Salt Lake City too, which was yeah. pretty cool. I think that was yeah, like cool. eleven or something like that. So yeah, all different places. But okay. all right, well I think we have a little wager then. Temple versus Colorado. We'll just yeah. uh little See wager you money. You know, See you money line. Let's go. Money line. All right, I'm gonna there tell you. Well, um, I think we'll send it over Darren on the pod. Um, you know, Ant, if you want to give a little intro to like you know, obviously, yeah. Darren Goodwin, owner of Narch. Um, but, you know, this is kind of part of the Team USA series as well, too. So, yes. So, um, you know, as of recent, with the new national de- development program, uh, they've released, you know, p- pieces of information just kind of leading up to, you know, the rosters and everything like that. And one of the big uh, announcements is Darren Goodwin coaching the junior team uh, along with Dan Maxwell this year. So um, you're going to have a nice mix of uh, coaches there. Darren, it's going to be his first time with this group of guys. <laughs> So in this interview, we're going to talk Narch, obviously, because, you know, that's his baby. And then we're also going to talk about um, well, what got him interested into coaching this uh, this junior team specifically. And he's doing a few things out in California. They're going to help with the development process and that ongoing pipeline that Tim talked about the other day. So um, it's pretty cool. We're going to have more um, USA stuff coming up, uh, especially because a lot of the uh, rosters are going to be announced over the next few weeks. Um, so we'll be doing a lot of like the Team USA stuff leading up to that. And then we we kind of teased it earlier, getting some players on and things like that. So uh, doing a bunch with Team USA, obviously bringing you other stuff. But this is uh, this is definitely going to be a good one with Darren. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's send it over to the podcast. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another edition of the RDN Roller Show. We've been absolutely buzzing lately on the four check the past few weeks, bringing you interviews. And it's our pleasure to bring on the owner of Narch, the man, the myth, the legend, 
Darren Goodwin, how's everything going? And um, congratulations on being named head coach of the Team USA Junior Men's Squad. Well, thanks, Anth. Uh, yeah, no, good morning. Um, things are good over here. Really, really busy, but uh, appreciate the kudos for that. I'm excited to, to be part of it and uh, excited for the NARC season. So you got two big tournaments coming up. You got Chicago coming up. And then we were just talking about this on the pod. I think the Irvine Regional, just in like all hockey tournaments, that's like one of the biggest regional and qualifier before you get to nationals. It's always like one of the most competitive. What are like, what are you doing, you know, to get, I guess, prepared for this? And like, you know, you have so many teams entered and stuff like the day to day. You know, what's nuts. Um, Friday was our deadline and our deadline, you know, some events, it's a very hard deadline. Some events, it's a little softer deadline. And I know people are just getting off the ice. So anyway, my point is um, I had to take, I had to take registration down uh, Friday night because we had, we had 114 teams in this event last year and we use Corona a lot. We've got 128 teams in this event coming up wow. and I had to actually cancel the junior division and I canceled the forties because we only like, those are divisions that, you know, they're going to happen, but people kind of drag their feet and all the other divisions are so big that I'm, you know, I was going over the ring time with Alex. I'm like, dude, this is going to be insane. I don't know how we're going to fit all the games. So it's unfortunate for the teams that might not have been able to get in this, but hopefully they understand it's nothing personal. We just don't have ring time. It's a good problem. Yeah, I mean, when you have 128 teams that are regional, that's, you know, that's, like you said, that's a great problem to have. Um, is there any, you know, for the Irvine Regional, any teams coming out of state that, you know, normally don't come to this turn, to the Irvine Regional? Yeah, we've got, uh, you know who's coming from uh, your neck of the woods is uh, Scooby Snacks. There we go. They, uh, the little 18 and under squad, junior squad. Yeah, well, they're, they're playing, uh, they're playing in silver. Okay. Uh, we've got, uh, we've got teams, a couple teams from Mexico City coming. Oh, there we go. Uh, We've got a good contingency from Arizona coming with different programs, you know, Outcast being the biggest, but uh, Yuma's coming, you know, uh, NorCal, of course, is coming, a couple Nevada teams. So, yeah, it's, it's, um, I mean, it, it's right up there in, in size with Winter Nationals. It's, it's, you know, maybe tw not, we had 145 last year at Winter Nationals, 128 the year before. Uh, you know, not quite the diversity with the teams from from Canada and everywhere else, but everyone is out of the woodwork in Southern California. Everybody's playing that didn't get shut out. <laughs> well, you, you mentioned something. You're talking about some of these out of state teams. Um, I wanted to kind of ask you more about like the teams internationally, too, that have been attending March as of recent. Like what kind of impact uh, has that had on the tournament and how did you get in contact with those teams? Like how did that all come about? Uh, kind of organic, different ways, I would say, depending on the program. I mean, you take like, like this year will be a little bit different than last year. I think in terms of, uh, different programs participating, there'll be even more variety, but we're not going to have those two huge groups from Taiwan come. Uh, a lot of these, what a lot of these international teams do is they kind of, and this has happened for a long time. They, they map it out and they come every other year. Uh, because it's such an expensive trip to come out. And and so that's kind of their thing. Some some teams come every year, like Renee with the uh, the Desert Rats. He, he, I don't even know how many teams he'll have. I would say a minimum of 10. Uh, and I know that he's going to pick up probably some of Dom's players that were was here last year uh, with kids that want to come or parents that are really motivated to come that just are, that those same teams aren't coming. Uh, we've got Roller Hockey Concepts back from France. They came two years ago. They're going to be back. Uh, of course, Dave and Pablo with the Golden Knights Academy. The you know, some of these programs pick up pick up kids from all over the world, and it's um, you know it, it, it's different. You know, the U.S. is such a big place, and you go to Europe and you could travel three countries in two and a half hours. So it's it's different in that way. It was cool at Winter Nats, like seeing all the different representation of different countries there from just players as an individual, right? Like with the Golden Knights Academy, you had girls from Spain, France, everything. So it was cool to uh, it was cool to see that, and and I think it uh, it kind of like brings a different vibe to it too because they're so excited to be there and like we're roller hockey, like the birth of roller hockey, where it blew up, 
And you can see just how excited they are to be at, at an arch winter national, which is always, I, we always say it's the kickoff of the roller hockey season. It's like one of the best events of the year by far. So well, yeah, it's I, awesome that it's impacted in a positive way. Yeah. And I, I appreciate that. And I agree with you a hundred percent. Just wanted to get back. I don't want to leave a couple of countries out that I know are coming. Uh, Colombia is bringing teams. New Zealand's bringing teams and uh, more teams from Canada. You know, uh, Pure Maple will be there. Mika does a good job with them. Zulu will be there, I'm sure. But we've got like some random teams from uh, Saskatchewan coming and Alberta coming, and, you know, cool. Ontario coming. So it's going to be uh, the finals this year is going to be pretty epic in terms of international flavor. Do you ever get nervous about those Canadian teams that come down that, you know, like they play just a, a more physical game sometimes. Do you ever like when you see them coming, like, well, you know, who am I going to get like on this team? Because they play a fun game to watch, you know, and it's, it, they do play physical. Um, but you know, do you ever worry? I, I'm not worry in what sense, like stuff's going to get out of hand. No, just like, it's just a great, like, it's fun to watch. Like I like watching that pure maple team. Cause they're a lot more physical then you're, you know, compared to another, you know, like a black ice team, you know, and it, it brings an interesting game to watch, you know, because now these teams are playing two different types of styles. Yeah. They're, they're, you know, they're more run and gun and yeah. it's been like this for a long time. And even the, you know, you go back to when we had a lot of finals in Ontario and, you know, so many good young players were growing up. They're all ice guys. They're all ice guys that are very skilled ice guys. So they, you know, that's, they want to come out, play role or have fun. So it's just completely run and gun style versus, you know, some of the teams that you, you mentioned where it's like, all right, let's slow it down, keep possession, play our game. And, and so it's just, you know, good style, two different styles make good fights. Right. So it's, uh, it's interesting in that regard. So keeping on, like, the inter- on the international thing, like when that, t- uh, the team from Chinese Taipei came, came over, um, you know, what was that like for you? Like that, that must've been really cool. Like, you know, kind of step in the right direction, getting a team like that over there. And what did you see from them that made them such a good team? You know, it, one of the most difficult things is going back and forth with these teams you don't know and trying to get them in the right division. Because we, I mean, ultimately, I think 99% of people, we want the same thing. We want you to come over. We want you to have a great time, uh, positive experience. We want you to be competitive. What I don't want is a team to come over, um, play in a lower division, mop up everyone. And then I got a lot of, you know, pissed off customers that play Narch all the time going, why did you let this team play silver? And like, I, like France a couple of years ago, uh, when they came, uh, not this group, but another group came and, you know, they're, as you guys know, like different countries are pretty boisterous in the stands and, you know, and they're cheering on there, which brings in energy like no other. Right. But so this particular group I'm thinking of, you know, they won the championship the championship game was a good game. I think it was five, three, five, two final. So if people are coming up and complaining to me just because their kids lost, I, you know, I'm just like, you know, give me a break, go back, practice harder, whatever. Like it was a good championship game, but you know, in a, in a few isolated incidents over the years, you know, a team will kind of, you second guess like, yeah, we probably should have put them up. Um, and the opposite has happened e- even more where we put them up, they get mopped up, they spend all that money to come out and it's not as good of an experience as it could have been. So that's kind of the toughest thing about it. And so I guess, sorry to be long winded. I'm on my third cup of coffee now. <laughs> um, the, uh, the hardest part going into it is making sure these teams are in the right place. So there's some communication back and forth. We try to find people who have been to NARCH that have also seen their team. And in terms of that Taipei group, I, I heard they were going to be good. And I, I knew that they were, you know, and they're like, we want to play in your top divisions. Like, just, it wasn't even a question. So I'm like, all right, we'll see. You know, I mean, I think that's great. It's going to add a flavor to the event. And not only did they play and compete, um, I don't want to say they dominated. The championships were all good games, but they, for a team organization to come out of nowhere and play in an event like the Narch Finals and do as well as they did, I think it, it blew a lot of people away. Yeah, I think like you, I think they, we saw them at like the like World Juniors, I believe it was, and they had like some of the players play men's and they had like the three wheeled skates. And then, you know, I think once people saw them on 
the schedule at Narch, they were just so excited. I wanted to watch their games just because, you know, they're a fun team to watch and it's just, it adds the international flair. So um, it was cool to see them go there and win. Like that is, you know, a pretty cool thing for the event to see as well too. Yeah. I mean, if you're coming here and you're winning the highest level, it's like, yeah, good job, man. It's, it's incredible. Absolutely. So, you know, Narch has had so many NHL players that have came through, you know, played Narch growing up that even continually play Narch too at Narch Pro. Um, you know, you saw Connor Bedard playing Narch. As a young player, did you ever see like that talent is, you know, going to make it to the NHL or is it, you know, just too young to see or, you know, watching him play a role? Or did you ever, you know, see like, wow, this, this player will play in the NHL? Yeah, there, there are a number of players who I thought would make it and, and some did and some didn't. I mean, going way back, I mean, I, I knew Bobby Ryan probably would. Um, you know, he's one that stands out. Um, there were a lot that were already playing, you know, Peewees, Bantams, especially Bantams. When you're 16, you, and you're a good player, like you kind of know if that, if those kids are, are gonna, are gonna do well. Um, our 16, U platinum championship a couple of years ago, uh, you know, it had multiple NHL players in it. And again, that was in Ontario. So, you know, that those, those guys are kind of, you know, they're on the way, but um, with Connor, like his shot, he, like his team was good. They weren't great, but they were, they were good. And they were playing against other teams that had like three or four solid guys. So even with three kids draped on him, trying to stop him and knowing that he's the guy you got to stop to win the game, he's still scoring a couple unbelievable goals and, you know, he shot like a man when he came over and he was only, you know, 14, 15. So there was some hype around him already. It's like, all right, this kid, and you hate to say somebody's, especially, a, you know, a young guy, it's like, oh, he's definitely going to be this. And he's definitely like, there's so much development that goes on between when you're 14, 15 and 18 or even 21. So I, I threw it out there when I posted, I'm like, this is going to be a, a first rounder. Um, I didn't say first overall pick. I wasn't going to do that, but, and I didn't honestly didn't know if that would be the case, but so to answer your question, yes, it's mm -hmm. you see it sometimes. And then you get late bloomers. Sometimes there I, might even be a couple in that photo behind you. That was, uh, yeah, that was, do you, do you see that his background photo? That was from, it. I guarantee you that was from 2001 at Tico arena. So yeah, that, um, was that the all-star game? The, where you had the all-star game with, okay. I remember that all-star you game you had, you know, I know Pat Maroon was on. There's just so many different faces, you know, I think Eton too, of, you know, they're still playing, but it was like one of the most legendary picks. Cause it's all these get kids and they're, you know, prime youth age. And now they're still playing either in the NHL or high level, you know, inline hockey. That actually might be Oh three, but that's Tico arena. And it's a pro game. You, I could see it. I could see yeah. it. And that <laughs> That's, it looks like the Mudcats, it might be Mudcats Rink Rat. Um, I can yeah. tell that it's old because of the next logo on the boards and they I weren't around. So. I was literally going to say that. Look at some of these logos on the, and is that a hyper logo on the on the floor? Yeah, and Kryptonics. Like a V-form? <laughs> it almost looks like a V-form logo next to it. So you can tell that's, that's an age photo. I always thought it was cool because I remember, I think, and Darren, correct me if I'm wrong here, I think it was in... Um, uh, Silver Creek and Sam Gagne play. There was a bunch of NHLers like that have played in Narches in the past, but I remember like Sam Gagne being there and being like blown away because at the time he was like one of those crafty guys, and it could have been Ontario or um, in Ontario as well. But I remember Sam Gagne being at one of the events as well. Funny story, Sam Gagne. Uh, I don't know if you remember in 0405 we had the there was an NHL lockout and we had a relationship with the NHL where we announced the NHL Junior All-Stars. Um, it was it was cool. And then at, at the Narch Finals, we had the Stanley Cup because it wasn't traveling with the team. So all co cool stuff that Narch benefited from because it was a lockout. Sam Gagne, I remember taking a photo of him to put him in the magazine in the back room at Joe Dumars Fieldhouse. And I'm sure I could dig up the photo. Like, he's got a polo. He looks like a little scrawny scrawny guy and he's you know he's not a huge dude anyway but uh he's another one like yeah this kid's gonna gonna dominate and i think he was 16 in the photo and if i, I want to say he was one of the youngest guys to i know at one point he was the youngest guy in the nhl at 18 so yeah, he's still playing <laughs> like he's still playing on the winners it's crazy that 
that NHL Junior All Stars thing was so cool because it would come in the magazines as well too. And you got, I think it was like the shirt. I think it was for two years, right? We did it about four. Okay. Um, yeah, we mixed it up. You get a polo one year. They would do like they did a you know a a black kind of like tighter fitted shirt with a NHL Junior All Star logo. You look like one of the uh, what was it? The sprockets from uh, was it the sprockets? I don't know. I'm aging myself. Is it, it was like the turtleneck kind of like yeah, a, yeah, 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 yeah. I had that one. I I don't know how I got picked. I mean, tournament yeah. director must have felt sorry for me or something, but uh, somehow I got picked. And uh, yeah, it was I didn't want to ship them. You were working at the rink, something like that. Right? Yeah, I think that's what it was. Um, talking about like you know this rink in particular. Is there a favorite? Uh, Narch Summer Finals, like uh, rink location or or even year that you had, you're like, this was just, it ran great. It was smooth. Um, is there a certain, um, you know, year that sticks out to you that you liked the most? Every year is a little different for different reasons. Uh, and they're all memorable. Um, you know, some of it's the competition, some of it's the facility, some of it's because of how smooth or non-smooth it ran. Uh, the rink you're looking at, or the rink in the background was probably my favorite favorite to go to just because um the facility was beautiful you know it was a vacation destination sort of california people don't really like going there but for everybody else in the country they like florida um so i have a lot of good memories from there but even you know more recently when i you know i left irvine last year after it all you know it's a huge kind of decompression of everything it's like big sigh of relief all right it's over and it's like man that was a great event so many good games it was smooth and and they all vary and we had some really good times in san jose too some really really good times in san jose and uh you know even the hershey center in canada like we've we've been lucky to go to a lot of good venues i would say one that sticks out on the other side of the coin would be cincinnati in 04 um and it yeah and it's it's not that um we didn't know where we were going to go that year. And I knew that by doing it there, we would get a, a record breaking turnout because a lot of people could drive there, you know, being in the Midwest. I mean, that's, you know, there's a reason Tim keeps state wars kind of in, in that market. It's, it's such a good spot for people to get to, but you know, we were, we, you go there, you got to cover the ice, you know, they had like, I don't know. It's like Chuck E. Cheese in one side of the building. Um, there's a huge figure skate that's ugly. In fact, that that orange banner that you guys have seen a, a million times at Narch events that's absolutely huge. Yeah. It it was made to cover the figure skate in 04 in Cincinnati. And <laughs> and it did, it covered it, but it was like that banner had to be made in two pieces. It's so big. So that's crazy. Yeah, the, I remember the the Cincinnati had yeah like a Chuck E. Cheese had a play place like in the middle of it, right next to one of the rinks, and you're like playing a game, and you're hearing kids scream. You're like, "What's going on here?" But yeah, I, I remember uh, the Cincinnati rink. I you know that was that was a cool rink. Um, but like you said, all those rinks, like getting to go to Canada, that was a really cool experience for like a lot of the American teams too. And you know, there's a lot more Canadian teams, so the competition was very high. Um, just in you know the physical regard and stuff. So yeah, I've uh, I really enjoyed the Mississauga rink. That was one of the funnest rinks uh, I can recall. Oh, it sounds like you're afraid of the Canadians. What's going on here, like dude? I don't okay. The Canadians are just like, I remember being young going up to Edmonton and playing like 14 and under. There's a team like Manitoba Elite, and they all just, they're all ice players. They're just like levels above. And I just always have, I thought the game has been, the way they played it, been so interesting and so cool and the roller aspect. I love the physical stuff. So I just thought it was cool how they play. So anytime I see a Canadian team, I'm just like, this team's going to play hard. It's going to be a good game. I remember um, in Men's Plot the one year when we were doing Liberty, we played a team from Western Canada. I don't remember their name, Darren, you might, but I remember everyone was like, oh, these guys are going to be ice guys. They're not going to be able to skate, blah, blah, blah. We go up like quick 2 nothing. They came back and beat us like 8-2, to two, like 8 unanswered because every shot they took was like back bar. And it was in a, I think it was in a semifinal game, I want to say. And we came and we were a pretty good Men's Plot team, you know, growing up and stuff. And I was like, what the hell? So Rob, I'm right there with you. Honestly, I kind of, you're giving me PTSD from that because I remember going out there were two up two rip. We take a couple penalties. Next thing you know, like 
we look at the roster, we're like, half these kids playing the WHL. Like, what what were we thinking? You know, yeah. we, we got smoked by them eight two. We were just like depressed. So yeah, I, remember, I think it was in Florida, I want to say. So they were a good team. I don't remember what their name was, but they I remember they were like green and black and they were nasty. So back when you were, you know, in those years, there were there were a lot. And there were a lot of, you know, a lot of kids playing juniors that were just on the team. Nobody knows them, right? Because they're they we just <laughs> well, they, I mean you might know them locally wherever you're from but you you know uh yeah a lot of people would get recognized at the Narch finals but here's a here's a fun fact for you guys to think about um I was thinking about this the other day you know like in in the program now and and even through all the kids like very few people take slap shots like I still take slap shots like a lot of the old ice guys they they still take slap shots and Canadians. Canadians take slap shots too. So most of the most of the Americans, there's not that many guys that I notice that, that take slap shots. And I think that's, it's kind of a unique, you know, I don't know if it's just because of the ice background, which doesn't really make a lot of sense because everybody here plays ice too. But for whatever reason, maybe it's just me and it sticks in my head. Like, you know, who's taking You're right. The old guys and the Canadians. That's who's taking slap shots. Yeah, that uh, famous slap shot goal from our Liberty game against Palmer. You posted it like you posted like I feel like once every other year where uh, our but my buddy Jeff came down, took that slapper from like half court and it went bar down. So it's uh it's definitely something you don't see a lot in roller, especially, right? Like how many times do you see a clapper and roller? Not very often. Um kind of kind of talking about you were talking about all these teams that have competed in arch over the years. Um is there any like rivalry that sticks out of like amongst like two organizations coming together, whether it's from the past or it's present day? Um, there's a lot of good ones. Um, like, honestly, you kind of, you caught me off guard a little bit. Uh, I would say early days, it would have been the younger sniper teams against pretty much anybody. Like they, they just, uh, you know, New they're, Yorkers. <laughs> they had good teams. Uh, they battled hard. You know, Tim actually coached them. And uh, yeah, they they had some good paddles with like the Predators from out here. Uh, just like memorable stuff where, you know, the game would turn it, unfortunately, turn into a little bit of a shit show and, you know, kind of stuck out for the wrong reasons because I'm handing out suspensions. I'm hearing from one side, what do you expect me to do? The guy bit me. And then the other side, and it's like, all right, well... Yeah, pretty pretty gnarly stuff way back in the day. It didn't happen too much. Maybe that's why it sticks out, right? So, um, <laughs> but, but no, I mean, you know, way back in the day, uh, and again now, I mean, uh, uh, the OC Blades were always had good programs. They're you know they're eighty eights, eighty nines, like pretty much all of them. And then they um, they kind of went away, and Skyler's uh, brought them back from the dead, and done a really good job with that program along with Dan Maxwell and plugging in some young coaches and uh, give them a lot of credit. They, they play the Bulldogs out here all the time, like every single tournament. I mean, there's probably a game going on right now at the <laughs> tours between the two of them. So, you know, it's, it's when I think of good rivalries, I think of a team from teams from different team from the West coast team from the East coast that kind of end up in the championship quite a bit. Um, and there's been a lot over the years, but I can't think of too many off the top of my head. Yeah, I remember I always loved growing up, um, 16s, 14s, going to Narch, uh, seeing the Mudcats and Pama play. That was always like a big rivalry just for, I think, my age group getting to watch in pro just because the Mudcats were so dominant. You know, like Brian Yingling was like one of the most uh, – he was just unbelievable, and he was our coach for Stallions, but just hands were unreal. And then, you know, Pama were so young with Jerry Osterkamp and Eton just – a freak of nature and he still is but yeah those two teams watching them and pro growing up at narch was the coolest thing like they just went at it well and i think we're seeing that right now with with pro with black ice and palma you mm -hmm. know um those two seem to be at the at the top at least in terms of narch uh it seems like almost every championship in narch pro those two teams are the ones that are in it as of late and you're right like through different decades it's been different teams you know um Jeez, it, it's a lot of different teams dominated for like just a couple of years, but uh, you know, Black Ice and Palma have kind of kind of been at it lately. And like you said, yeah, the uh, the Mudcats were they kind of came on the scene when when I was still on the scene. And at that time, it's funny because they were the young guys, right? They were the guys getting beat like 
ate rip a couple times and stuff and they they took their lumps early and then they figured it out in the 2000s early 2000s and and certainly were competitive for many years there yeah one of the coolest things i find about narch in general is just the history and like you're saying every event brings a different story a different narrative and everything like that and we could go back and we could probably have 10,000 conversations on you know, great pro championships, junior championships. Revision like, versus mission, one of the coolest like championships to watch. Unreal. I mean, I remember the Mudcats for snipers, like that was a great championship at Silver Creek. Like there's been so many like just great narch moments, especially because I was, you know, a little younger there. You're watching those pro guys at that time. It was a little different of a game. They're a little more physical. They were like these, you know, these men playing hockey, and you were like, these dudes are savages. But it was so sick to watch some of those battles because they really got into it and those games got physical. And I remember Narch always let you play a little physical, right? Like as long as the stick work wasn't out of control, you're always allowed to throw the body around a little bit. And that's what kind of made that pro like a step weight, like a huge step above like a men's plat or anything like that, is that the physicality and those rivals were just like unmatched. So it's uh, definitely good. Well, in San Jose kind of, exaggerates it all too the rink's a little smaller you've got the the glass from top to bottom so when you know two big bodies hit those boards like they flex but don't break you know and wow. there's there's some there's kids right on the glass like if this breaks these kids are dead like it but you know it's not going to break um so to have it you know to be right there and you feel like you're inside the game almost um it, it makes for a pretty cool venue to watch that high level to play that, that's perfectly put like you feel like you're in the game that's exactly that's like the best way to put it so all right well awesome so a lot of narcs talk there let's move on to the usa uh stuff so um obviously you're involved with the usa program now as a coach um so what was most exciting about you uh getting on the bench again and getting back involved with the usa program um and specifically like the junior team well a lot of people don't know i i coached for for years before I took over Narch and, and even since I coached my kids in ice a bit and uh, I still, you know, I feel like I'm herding cats on Wednesdays, but I'm still involved grassroots level, you know, on my skates and stuff. So I, I've always had a passion to coach. So I've, this gives me a perfect opportunity where it's not a conflict with Narch or what I do otherwise, and I can get back into it. And at a very high level where I can teach kids, I say kids, but teach these young men, you know, things that I've learned over the years that I think will will benefit their game and hopefully they'll remember for a long, long time. So I'm I'm pumped to do it. Um, I think it's cool that it's in Roca Rosso. I haven't been there. I think we were there in 96. I won the world championships with Team USA um, at that place. So it's kind of good kinda memories, cool kind of cool to go back. Um, and I give a lot of credit to like, you know, Tim. Tim and Alex, you know, they're both Tim's the the men's coach and Alex is the uh, the girls coach. And, uh, you know, Shane's coaching the women's and all have great assistant coaches. You know, I've got Dan and Vio, but I feel like that they've got the right people involved that all truly care about the sport. And um, yeah, I'm 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 pumped to do it. And I hope whoever I select on the team is excited to play for me. With, you know, with you being the coach and, you know, owning Narch, running Narch, is there, is there a way that Narch can play a hand with uh, Team USA in, um, in this aspect? Yeah, great question. I, I 100%, and I think it has already shown. I mean, just by me promoting, you know, I said, look, you know, I really want to, I know we can't go everywhere and do camps everywhere, but one of the things that's very, very important to me is I want to make sure that every kid who's truly at that high level who has a chance to make that team gets gets a look and a legitimate chance to make that team so um we were doing this camp in in southern california right before the the narch regional which you know everyone we talked about the teams everyone that's anyone on the, on the west coast is going to be there so we'll get a really good look at, at the players on the west and then on the east you know i've been talking to uh to Tim and Greg and, and either other coaches I respect. And for the kids that, well, let me back up. First off, it, you, you've got to apply to be, you know, to be considered. Um, we have 58 kids who have applied right now. So part of what makes me being involved, I think that's a little bit special is 
that's how it should be. It shouldn't be there's 18 kids and we're taking 12. I mean, that's that's just not a real Team USA. So we've got 58 kids that have applied so far and the cutoff is soon, but I think we're going to be able to put together a great team. Um, they're being, they were looked at at Winter Wars East with, uh, again, with Tim and Greg. I'm going to be in Chicago next week. Uh, there's quite a few kids that applied. They're going to be playing in that tournament. Um, you know, Peter will be there. Costanza will be there too to give me their input as well. And then I'm I'm looking forward to the camp. So I think there's always going to be some tough cuts, and and we're we're going to be in situations where, you know, it's it's kind of a coin toss probably between a couple different players, and it's going to come down to, you know, who we think will probably work well together rather than who's just the best player in a certain situation. So we'll see. I mean, tough coaching things, right? That's part of part of the challenge of coaching. Yeah, I think one you know one thing that you did say is you know the right people are in you know ahead of this and are in the right places and i've mentioned this to you in the past about i think it's really good for you know narch usa the growth of roller hockey because now you're going to get a lot more input you're going to you see these players you see them at tournaments you see how they act how they lose how they win so i feel like kind of might see a little change in demeanor in some of these players when they're playing at these tournaments because not you're not just playing at narch now you're playing under the team USA banner, if you want to make that team and you kind of have to, you know, every, every tournament matters now. It's not just, okay, cool. We got swept in regionals. It's like, no, like, you know, you got to show up. You know, that's, it's, that's a great point by you. And I agree a hundred percent. Let's just say hypothetically, it comes down to three different players and they're all very close to making the team. And, you know, one player sort of has a history of taking bad penalties when he's, when he's down and frustrated and maybe another guy, chirps too much at the other team, but they're both great players. And then the third guy is maybe very close to as good or just as good, but he seems to be more of a team guy. Well, it's a no brainer. We're taking the team guy. So you, that's a valid point you brought up. And Tim brought it up the other day. Like you can't have 10 goal scorers on the team or 12 goal scorers, right? You need guys to fill roles. And, and sometimes that guy who's a good, we'll call it like a glue guy and still works hard and works his bag off. He's going to be the guy that I know I would want to coach. You would want to coach. And something you mentioned, like with the collaboration of all these great hockey minds coming together, another thing I think you, Tim, uh, Max, will everyone bring to the table is professionalism. And I think when you play for your country, you have to have that level of professionalism. You can't be, like you said, chirping in other country, right. And things like that. You need to just, recognize that you're wearing the team USA Jersey. And I think, you know, from you playing and coaching teams in the past, right. That's you're bringing this level of professionalism that you know, these junior kids really do need, especially at that age group. I think it's going to be a huge uh, benefit by having you Dan and VO on there. Well, I appreciate that. And I agree with you. Like I'm pretty no nonsense. Uh, and, you know, I want, you got to respect the game, especially with, with what I do for a living. Like I, it, you know, there's only so much I can do about it at, at times in, in a tournament, but I, you know, th there are certain times where I'll see a situation and I'll be like, man, that kid's lucky I'm not coaching him, right? Because he, it just doesn't stand. He's he's just, he's out there looking like a jackass. So, uh, yeah, that's not going to fly with Team USA. You're like, uh, you're, you're the torts of roller hockey. I love it. You know what I mean? <laughs> honest and hopefully I, hopefully i win more than he has been lately <laughs> oh come on that's a low blow <laughs> it, so with this junior uh you were talking about the id skate coming up is there any like details you can give us about that skate like what what is going to be at that skate and what can players expect you know it's going to be we'll do a couple drills but the main thing is scrimmage and we'll probably move some kids around and see you know some different combinations but uh and, you know, if they're if they're kids in question, a lot of the kids I've seen play before, but, you know, they'll they'll kind of be under a magnifying glass that weekend. And then we get to see them play throughout the tournament as well. So, you know, if it comes down to, you know, we're debating between a few kids, we at least get to see them for four or five, depending on if they're playing one division, maybe eight or 10 more games. Right. To see kind of how they how they do and compare them. But, um, yeah, so it's kind of it's it's more of a scrimmage. Um it should be great. We got a lot of talent. I mean, we've got some kids that are younger that that aren't really they're not trying out for this year's team per se. You know, they're a really good 08 or, or you know, a couple even 09s, but 
they, they want to be put on the radar for those future teams, which I think is a good idea. A um, little bit twofold. We don't, I don't want just a bunch of bodies out there to where we're not getting the best against the best. So I think right now, I think there's about 20 kids, uh, which is a perfect number. And if I'm, if I'm being completely honest, it could change, but I, I think there's probably, I predict there'll probably be four or five, maybe six spots up for grabs at that point. So going into that last weekend, cause we, we select the team right after that weekend. And, um, you know, it's not just my decision, uh, get input from the assistant coaches, but ultimately it's the uh, committee's decision. And, you know, Rob Turnerman's on the committee, Laura's on the committee, they'll both be there watching as well. So it, it's it's a collective agreement on, on who's going to make the team, but I would say we have probably a little more say so than, um, than just somebody, you know, randomly on the committee, but we'll see. It's it's cool because again we're talking about all these people that are involved in it. It's so much more organized of a process now, and even being able to organize something like this ID skate for these uh, junior players, even if they're younger, to get in that pipeline and get on your radar, get on the coach's radar, the board's radar is unbelievable. And with all these eyes watching, I mean, is there anything in particular? Like if you're talking to a junior player and he's interested, is there anything you're specifically looking for as like a coaching staff? Like you talked about being a good teammate. Um, you talked about, you know, obviously, uh, you know, Tim talked about playing year round and not just showing up and playing rollers or anything else that you would recommend to a junior player coming to the skate or looking to get interested with Team USA. Uh, if I had some advice, it would probably be don't try to do too much because so many kids that age, uh, they'll, you know, they, they feel like, all right, I got a, I got a one on two and I got to walk these two guys to make an impression. And, you know nine times out of 10, they're going to lose the puck. They're going to turn it over and they're going to, you know, end up giving up an odd man rush the other way or whatever. And, and I think a lot of kids, they're great players, super skilled, but they need to simplify their game to take it to the next level and trust their teammates more. And in a lot of these situations, you gotta, it's a little bit tough because they, they might play for a team where they got to be the guy and they got to put the team on their back. And if they're not doing that, their team's not winning. So now you're asking a kid like that, who's now among other kids that are similar, like, don't do that anymore. You know, move the puck, make the easy play, let the puck do the work. Let's keep possession. Let's, you know, score when we have an opportunity. So there's, there'll be an adjustment for some kids to, to make the team. I think at that age group, that's, a perfect word of advice because sometimes when you have that one on two you want to take them but sometimes it's better just pull it back and keep the possession because especially on in the international game it's a little more chaotic I feel like it's not as much of the puck possession so if you could dominate the puck that's usually when you frustrate other countries and they break their system a little bit because you're going to see you know against USA typically you see the box a lot and if you could pull them out of that and get them one-on-one -on -one in certain situations it's usually a benefit for the team anyway so I think that's great advice is don't try to do too much and you know obviously work hard and 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 really take it seriously and be dedicated to to being a part of Team USA. No well said I know you've been part of it quite a bit huh? Yeah, well, I got lucky, you know, blind up finds this or blind squirrel finds a nut every once in a while. So is there um, you know, you've talked about coaching in the past. Let go me ahead, go yeah. back to Anth real quick. Like uh dude, you impressed me at Winter Nationals. You played for Skittles, like you were Thanks. you know, um, I, I was kind of like, all right, let's see, let's see what he's got, like a bunch of young kids, but no, you you kind of played like the elder quarterback, made some good Definitely. plays, scored some nice goals, like yeah. Oh, because I kept trying to get good photos of you. So I was watching you a lot. So well, I got the crazy head tilt going on. So it's hard to get a good, good photo of me on the rig. But yeah, that was, you know what I said? I don't know if you just like real quick. I feel like that 35 division was almost harder than pro at some points, you know, or that 30 and over division. Sorry. It was like harder than pro because those games were like, they were battles. They were physical and everything. So playing two divisions, I learned my lesson, but I appreciate it. I mean, playing with them was different too, because they're so young and running gun. I was like, guys, we got to pull it back every once in a while. So, and we were light, you know, as far as like the bench win and everything. So I appreciate it. But, you know, like I said, I got, played a couple of years with the Team USA program. And obviously like I, you know, admired those years. And I think playing internationally is one of the coolest things you could ever do. I think, and you, and you know, right from experience and coaching it as well, like, it is a different feel than playing like just your regionals, nationals, things like that. So it's funny you bring that up because I'm actually I did it last year 
and I'm going to do it again this year. There's a uh, world championships for the old guys, right? It's a, it's a, what's it? It's, it's kind of a, it's a legends tournament, I guess is what they call it. Uh, David with, uh, I believe it's Mi Miwa runs it. It's a good event. So it's, it's 38s, 45s and 50s. And a lot of the guys that grew up playing Narch that are still good players that still want to get out there and, and be part of it. Uh, they are part of it. And it's, it's it's really cool to to go to a different even even at our age to go to a different country bond with the guys you know shoot the shit in the locker room and have some fun and you know at this point in our lives we take our wives have some you know it's it's more of a of a sightseeing trip too with some cop with some hockey combined into it but it's um I guess my point is like it it doesn't get old representing your country especially Team USA so uh, a lot of guys really look forward to this event and I'm looking forward to it. Can you uh, talk about some of the players on your roster that you guys have going out there and, um, you know, like who they are? For 15 over? Yeah. If it's been released. You're the Legends, right? You're the Legends team. How do they do it? They do Legends. If Legends is the oldest, that's the team I'm on. So yeah, You're a Legend, yeah. It's, it's legends, legends, Veterans, and Masters. Okay. So, you know, one's 38, the other one's 45s, and then they were going to raise it to 52, but they kept it at 50s. Um you know, uh, Glenn, Glenn Mears, I know, is on the team. You kind of put me on the spot. I mean, the Labeda brothers are on the team. Uh, obviously, Rob's on the team. Jay Mazur's on the team. Beauty. This is off the top of my head here. Um, geez, who else? Terry Shook's back on the team. Um, I think they just posted it, and I apologize because I haven't paid too much attention to it because I've been so wrapped up with the Servine event. Um, but we got a solid squad. We had a good team last year uh fell short played bad one game which happens in hockey and uh i think this year we'll hopefully bring home goal your team's kind of stacked <laughs> looking at the roster here like, it? it's it's you got some east and it's cool you got east coast midwest and west coast guys all on there so it's pretty cool like you have a guy from my area bob meacham he's the goaltender he's yeah. a stud like he'll take like 60 shots a week like when we shoot around with them and stuff you got um michael Tadeo from the east coast you, you mentioned mazer i mean that guy's just an absolute legend and one of the best human beings ever. So um, he's definitely gonna bring some entertainment. He got hurt right at the last event. And that kind of, that was a big loss, right? Such a senseless thing too. We're playing, I forget which country, but we're up pretty big and you know, it's the end of the game. We're up, whatever, six goals, seven goals, whatever it is. And the guy, like turns mid rink, takes a slap shot, hits him right in the chest, like from eight feet away Jeez. With, with like a still mount puck. Right. And those things aren't soft. So he had, you know, his ribs were sore for, you know, once we were, and it was a preliminary game. So he, uh, he still battled through it. He was still effective, but yeah, he would have been a bigger asset if he hadn't taken a puck to the chest. He's it, even off the rink though. He's an asset because he's just like the best like team guy. He's just a man. I love Jack. No, it'll be, it'll be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Do you, uh, do you play some of the like players that when you were younger playing for USA, do you play still some of those players from a different country? Or are they still playing? Funny you ask that. I was wondering that going into last year. And next thing I know, I end up up at the bar having beers with about, you know, 15 people I hadn't seen in 20 some, you know, years that, you know, you, you remember going back that far. Cause I haven't, I haven't played for team USA since I think, I think 2000 was my last year, but you know, people, people came up and remembered me and uh, yeah, it was, it was cool. Like talking about, you know, some of the old world championships and stuff. I mean, it, it's kind of, you know, Michael Hunt's a guy that like, you could just sit back and watch that guy talk and it's hilarious. Like he just story after story, but anyway, to your point, yes. Go ahead, Anthony. I was going to say, it's such a cool event. And, and you'd mentioned that, um, you know, it's kind of a destination one too, because you're going to Spain this year. And that's a country I've always wanted to travel to. So it's awesome because it's one of those things where I feel like as you get older, you bring the family to something like that too, because then it turns into, you know, you're, you don't have many years left, you know, as you get older, right? Playing at, at events like this, your chances become slimmer and slimmer. So it's cool that you can do something like this still, even at, you know, at the 50 plus division and still go away and compete at the highest level at that age group in a different country like Spain. Like that's so cool. Yeah, and I'll be honest with you, that's a huge attraction. I mean, last year it was in Italy and we we flew into we flew into Venice, spent time there. 
uh, ended up spending some time in Florence. So, you know, the, the trip for Tanya and I was, uh, I don't want to say it was as important as the hockey, but it was as important as the hockey. <laughs> like it was, it was a really good time. So Barcelona, same thing. I've never been to Spain, looking forward to flying into there, spending a couple days. And then, uh, I think the, the events in a place called uh, Yaka, Yaka. Uh, which is, seems like it's in the middle of nowhere, but I'm sure we'll find some cool stuff to do away from the rink. Um, river rafting stuff like that so it'll be fun when you i know last year at the event you took you took some photos took some pretty cool drone shots and stuff do you i mean everyone knows you're unreal on the camera making videos taking pictures do you have a hard time when you're there like separating the two like i want to have some fun to play hockey but you know i do want to get some like some cool content for the guys um i didn't intend to do as much as i did last year uh it's just with talking to a lot of the guys, like, you know, we'll be back at the hotel and we're having dinner and we're talking old Narch stories and, you know, games pop up that like, remember this, remember when that happened? It's like, man, I forgot about a lot of this stuff. And, and, you know, obviously it's, it makes me realize how important Narch has been to them in their lives to remember the moments that they're kind of, were going over. So it kind of inspired me. It's like, man, you know, these guys, like, no one's no one's really doing there are a couple people taking photos and videos, but like they're not going to be able to get access to it like I can give them if I'm especially if I'm just shooting them. So, you know, kind of the rule I had last year is like, look, if I'm going to be at the rink anyway, um, I'm going to spend some time shooting these guys because I know they'd appreciate it. So that's what I did. And, you know, I'm, I may do a little less of it this year. I may do a little bit more. I'm not quite sure. I want to make sure that uh, my wife doesn't feel neglected when we're there either. No, it shows the real passion, like, honestly, behind it. I think, you know, you're not only you're playing, but you're now, like you said, you're taking, you know, pictures for these guys and, you you know, you're you're doing it for your own, you know, your own company for Narch all the time, too. But, you know, to go to a different country, you know, and do that, I really think it shows a true passion behind, you know, why you do love the sport, you know, you know, for the players. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And, yeah, I mean, my philosophy with Narch for, for a long, long time has been, you know, moments only happen once. And, you know, I, I really, it's not that I can capture every moment on every rink, but I know from, from my life and even, you know, the moments I have captured of my kids when they were younger, like it may not mean that much to you the next week or the next year, but to reflect back in 10 years or 20 years and, and, you know, show your kids or talk about a story with an old friend and to have those moments captured, it's important. Um, it's important to me anyway, to, to try to do as much of that as I possibly can within, within, you know, all the Narch events. And I used to take some grief, like when, when a lot of this kind of, when people, we've always done a lot, like even before social media has become the animal that it has, you know, we, we, we had videos and we've, you know, I mean, you guys have seen it. We pull up stuff from 2002 or whatever. The old Narch website with the photos and videos. I'd go. I still like. I remember going through the old layout and you had the quizzes on the side. So yeah, I, yeah. You, the content has always been there. Yeah. So uh, I guess my point is like some some parents. I used to hear like kind of whispers like that guy doesn't care. He just you know he takes the camera and he goes to the other end of the rink. He doesn't want to deal with. It. It's like no, that's not it. It's just you know in ten years you're gonna thank me. I just got you know your kid scoring an overtime game winner instead of having some random conversation with you. Uh, so it's just been something that's important to me. And and I, I'm glad I'm still passionate about it. I was going to say, like, where did that passion come from? Like, have you always been in, in like interested in taking videos and photos like ever since you were younger? Or is it something that once you started NARCH, you realized how important uh, this stuff could be uh, moving forward for not only us as players, but for the for the brand and everything? Both. Um, I, even in junior high, like I was, I was in photography. Um, I was the, uh, uh, I had photography every, every semester of, of junior, junior high I took, took photography. Then I took advanced photography and then I was the, uh, teacher's assistant for the other two. And so I was like, I mean, we're talking again, most people on this podcast won't even understand, but like, you know, a dark room with emulsion and the smell of it and real film and developing pic, like, so yeah, I've I've always had a real passion for uh, photography, and then you know to be able to kind of uh, apply it to to hockey, um, 
and what I love is, has been awesome. So it's combining two things I'm very passionate about. So there's one thing that I kind of like want to bring up, but I also want you kind of more elaborate on too. Um, I know you used to have the Narch podcast about, I think, you know, was it two years ago was the last one or? I honestly don't remember doing any, I think we did one from Atlanta that might've been our last one. Okay. So, um, yeah. So it, it was definitely pre COVID. Yeah. And I, you know, I remember, I think Eton maybe was like the first one, but it was, you know, it, it was really cool. Um, what I loved about listening to it is just hearing, you know, your thoughts. You have so much knowledge from like what we're talking about from like, you know, the 90s game of Narch, you know, even the 2000s that a lot of people love to hear and talk about. Um, and we were talking earlier that you're going to be bringing back the Narch podcast. I am. I am. And it's uh, it's I'm really excited about it because to your point, I think. I think you guys have done a, a really, really good job uh, covering, especially the pro aspect from not just here, but around the world. And kudos for that, because I, I think you guys do an amazing job. Um, but I think even with what you guys do, you've kind of changed from what you started as. And what I mean by that is you were you were more localized because that's what you knew best. And as you've grown and got to know people and got to really be more knowledgeable yourselves about what's going on in the world you've you've expand um funny i don't know if you remember this but uh we did an arch podcast at winter nationals in a restaurant bar lobby at a hotel me you and casey escarcega and, and you were on there and that's when you guys launched roller dad so i had you on the narch podcast talking about roller dad and how it was going to come out and I think Anth showed up the next day and played in that. That was uh, Winter Nationals at uh, Huntington Beach. And so it, it's kind of funny how this is reversed now. Like you're you're now announcing that I'm coming out with a podcast when I did Full that circle. back in the yeah. day. Full circle. Yeah, exactly. So I think where this is going to be a little bit different, um, you know, the one we did before was it was at events. We would just wing it. It was, you know, dudes talking about what's going on during the tournament. Some funny stories for sure. This one's uh, definitely some more thought put into it. We're going to uh, do some recaps of the tournaments, uh, implement some video aspects of that. So, for example, uh, you know, after I go to Chicago, I'm hoping to get Dan Costanza on afterwards and and talk about, you know, kind of some highlights from that event and then show video video to go with whatever it is we're talking about so i think that's an aspect that'll be cool but there's just so many interesting people in this sport you know coaches players rink owners manufacturers and everyone's got a story right everyone there's a lot of things that that to your point people would be interested in that just don't know about so i want to dig deeper and get by the podcast make them aware and get to know people a lot better and what makes them tick and also share all those great stories and background and stuff like that. So I'm pumped to do it. I yeah, no, I go ahead. Andy. I think it'd be really cool to hear some of that like history aspect, like you're talking about from maybe some of the um, guys who, you know, start were in the early two thousands, late nineties playing roller because I'm sure the stories are great uh, as usual as uh, things were, you know, kind of crazy back then. But, um, but I think it's just cool to get like the whole history of, of, of roller hockey. And obviously you've been around the game for so long. I think you're probably the perfect you know person to kind of get some of those stories out of those guys. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's like I said, it's going to be fun. I mean, it's not going to be, you know, it, it's not going to be an old, old bird part podcast where it's just, you know, me and a bunch of guys my age talking about stuff that we did back then. There'll be some of that for sure, it'll but cool. it'll, it'll be some new stuff too. Uh, and, and talk about what's going on, you know, today where, you know, where we might be going for future events. What's what I'm thinking, you know, what people are, are doing in general at the rink. So it's, it'll be cool. I've got some, got some neat things planned that I think you guys will enjoy. Yeah, if you if anybody can do lining up the video, doing the podcasting, I think you know the Narch Pod is going to be perfect for that. You already capture you know so many so many moments you know from the past where you know you can line them up. So I think that's really going to be perfect for that. Uh, I got two hot seat questions for you. Okay, one: Who is the best hockey golfer in roller? that you have golfed with? Like who is the best golfer that plays roller that you have golfed with? I know you love golf. I know you do golf a lot. 
So who's the one that best that you've played with? Oh man. I haven't played with a lot of them. I, I know that a lot, I, from what I've seen, there's some really good ones. Uh, like Troy Terry, I know is, is a, Oh, not Troy Terry. Um, Chris Terry, Chris Terry. Right. I, I hear he's, I've seen some stuff he's posted and I think he's, uh, he's phenomenal. Um, Jesus, I just went brain dead. What's his name? Pete Messina. Pete Messina from uh, lives Illinois. in Illinois. I yeah. think he just won his club championship. So, you know, he's not much. He played for the Mudcats forever back in the day, too. Yeah, he was Team USA as well. He's he's a big golfer. I still follow him. Yeah, he's a huge golfer. So I'm sure he's got a stick, too, because he had a bomb of a shot. So if it translates to golf, he's got to probably rope off the tee. So. so those are a couple guys that I would love to play with that I'm sure would – absolutely mop me up but um you know more recently we got a group together and we skated in that labeda rink uh, a couple sundays ago and we got uh, about eight guys out to play golf and i i got to play with brian watanabe and uh brian's brian's a stick he doesn't doesn't like hit the ball super far you know he's a smaller guy but man he's just uh from from 170 in he is just dialed like he's he's got a good good short game Okay. Yeah. I, I, I know you have, you know, you're playing golf, you know, you have your, you know, your golf account and stuff. So I just, you know, always wonder, I know Eton's played a ton, you know, and I see him always during COVID he was doing that. So, you know, just, just got to ask, you know, the legend who he thinks he's played with he the best. Up late and him and I are, him and I are actually a really good match. Like he's, uh, we're, we're kind of back and forth. So, uh, Alex who works for me, same thing, kind of back and forth, Jeremy Ellis, same thing, kind of back and forth. I mean, we're not, Look, I go out there and I'll, you know, I'll have blow up holes where I'll double or a triple. And then next hole, I might birdie and string off three parts. It's just, I'm all over the map, but I enjoy it. That's, you know, that that's all that matters. Um, all right. Well, you know, thank you, Darren, for joining the, the pod. We really appreciate it. I think this, you know, we'll definitely have to get another one before Team USA goes out, you know, to Italy and plays just so. When we have the roster out, we can talk a little more detailed and stuff. I think that would be really cool. Um, you know, but you know, thank you for taking your time to uh oh, I, Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Anytime, guys. I, I I love what you're doing. I appreciate you guys as uh being part of this and, and your friendship as well. Like we we have some good times away from the uh away from this too. And, oh yeah. Uh, it's it's oh, yeah. great. Yeah, it's uh we we appreciate you coming on and just to hear, you know, just the, all the stuff that all the knowledge you have uh regarding roller hockey is always just huge. Like I said, we could probably do, you know, 10 episodes with you talking about, you know, the past, the future, the present and everything. So I uh, appreciate you coming on. And then um, you know, obviously, you know, we'll talk to you before then, but best of luck, you know, with the ID skate coming up here on April 25th. So want to mention that to everybody and um you know, hope, I think it's a right step, a uh, good step in the right direction regarding uh, having you involved in the USA program. Well, one last thing on the Team USA note, um, I, I think it's going to, you know, by all of our involvement, I'm I'm pumped up to show uh, more exposure for the team, show some cool things, make the the kids on the team feel special. Just, you know, even from a media standpoint as well, like. And, and you'll probably see some things that I'm excited about sharing to where what should be happening and what probably will happen next year and the following year. And it will just continue to grow that every kid that that is a quality player that's in the USA will want to play for this team and they'll want to be part of it because they they see it and they're like, wow, didn't even know this existed. This is something I definitely want to aspire to do. And it, you know, it helps the sport too. It's one more thing in roller hockey where it's like, wow, that's, that's a goal I can now have to, to be part of that program on, on the men's and the women's side and the, and the boys and the girls. So. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Uh, well, thank you, Darren. We appreciate it. We'll see you this summer and hopefully we can get a part two of this interview talking about the roster. Well, nice looking hat. Appreciate it guys. We'll, we'll hook you up with another one next, next summer, this summer. Sounds good. We'll see you. Enjoy your Sunday.